And great to welcome now to our book talk segment, man, has written really a fascinating book, a historical book, a kind of a little known story about World War II, and it is called MacArthur's Spies, the soldier, the singer, and the spy master who defied the Japanese in World War II. We're joined today by a veteran foreign correspondent, Peter Eisner, on the telephone today, and uh, Peter, good to talk with you. How are you? Very well. Thanks, Doug. Doing well. Yeah, good to have a chance to chat with you for, for a couple of minutes. Uh, I have to say, uh, it's about the, the Philippines, uh, and my dad was stationed there during World War II. Too, but but he didn't tell me this story, so maybe he wasn't that part of the island when it happened. <laughs> well, you and I have something in, in common, really. It's really why I wrote the book, because my dad was uh, a Navy officer in the South Pacific and, and actually ended up fighting in the Battle of Leyte Gulf, which was Carol sure. MacArthur's retaking of the Philippines. And that's really why I started looking to find out stories about that. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly what years he was there. It was, it was right, I think, 1940. He was stationed. He had a good duty first. He was in Atlantic City for two years, and then they sent him to the Philippines. So it kind of went downhill. But I think that this may have already happened uh, before he got there. But it's quite a story you tell here. And uh, how did you do the research on it? Well, I spent some time in the Philippines, and I was lucky enough to be there for the 70th anniversary of the liberation of St. Thomas University, which is where four or 5,000 American civilians were detained right. uh, in Manila during World War II. And um, we got a chance to talk to some of the people who were children at the time, but vividly remember what it was like living under Japanese control. Um, but a lot of the research uh, ended up in the National uh, uh, Archives here in Washington, D.C., where I found papers that had not been looked at since World War II, which was very exciting, including the diary of who you could say is my main subject, Claire Phillips. Yeah, that's the most... I Claire mean, Phillips. I was going to say, that's, you have three characters here. That's the one that kind of, I think, most people are going to find most fascinating. She was a singer. Right. She was a singer from Portland, Oregon. Uh, she, she went to Manila just before the war looking for work, and uh, when the Japanese invaded, she ran off to the, to the hills above Manila to uh, Bataan which everybody's heard of, but don't know the, the, the larger story about what, what Bataan was like. Um, while she ran off to Bataan, many others did, and, and General MacArthur's forces in the Philippines retreated to Bataan and fought the, fought the Japanese for the next four months and finally surrendered. It was the largest surrender in U.S. history. Claire Phillips met up with some of the Americans who refused to surrender, ran off to the hills, including a guy named John Boone, um, an army cor corporal who, who uh, escaped to the hills and started forming a guerrilla um, operation to fight the Japanese. And she met up with him, and he sent her back down to Manila, where she opened a nightclub and began to spy on Japanese officers from the nightclub and then sending information back up to him. It almost reads, uh, or it does read, almost like a, a Mission Impossible story. These three people kind of doing undercover work, but uh, other jobs while they were there. It's fascinating. The amazing thing for Claire Phillips was she had no training to be a spy. She just just happened to be the perfect image of a spy. She she had multiple identities and, and, and marriages before the war that gave her lots of different aliases. She used a new alias when she got down to Manila and, and opened this nightclub. If, if she had been known to be just another American, she would have been in the uh, detention center. Instead, she... Uh, she used a, a, an alias and was able to uh, just operate for about almost two years uh, spying on the Japanese. And at the same time, she was able to gather food and medicine to give to prisoner of war camps where uh, Americans were suffering terribly and dying. And it was an amazing story on that. Would she get information, just, you know, people that came into the club and overhear things? Or how did she get that information? Just It was, it was quite... Um, more, more, it was more, more than that. I mean, she and the, and the women that she hired, who were, were singers and dancers, right. um, would circulate through the through the room. And you can imagine this this nightclub, kind of exotic nightclub, very close to the port where Japanese ships would be coming in. A uh, smoke-filled room, beautiful women walking around, a floor show, 
uh, the, the women kind of wandering around like geishas, lighting the cigarettes of, of Japanese officers. And, and, you know, when are you, you know, come back to me, you know, and just kind of come back. When are you going? Where are you going next? They'd ask this, this, the officers, uh, you know, come back and, and, you know, kind of like cooing and, and, and such. And all the time gathering information about uh, where the where the ships were coming from, where the ships were going, how many rosters of, of officers. Pretty amazing. And they, they collated the information at the end of the night and shipped it off into the hills. Yeah, how, how, did they, how did they get that information out? I guess you, you had to be in some kind of code, I would think, right? So, so nobody went to step. <clears throat> well, the first step was was using uh, some of the waiters in, in the in the uh, nightclub were, uh, were runners going up to uh, Bataan, they'd hide stuff in their in, in the soles of their shoes and and however they could. Sometimes in banana leaves, however they and then they got up into the hills. Um, from from there, um, John Boone, who who Claire was working with, um, had other runners that would get down to southern islands and eventually where they would reach radio transmitters in uh, southernmost Philippines, Mindanao, for instance, and then they'd be able to transfer transfer information down to Australia, where General MacArthur was operating. Now, did MacArthur, uh, he didn't plan this particular mission with these three people, but obviously he benefited from it. Uh, when do you think he learned about it, uh, that, these, you know, that these three people were doing this? So the third person that we haven't mentioned is, is Chick Parsons, who, who was operating out of Manila before the war. He was an American expatriate. Right. Um, he was a businessman, but people didn't know he was a Navy officer. And uh, he, he started uh, spying himself, but he he was able to parade around as the Panamanian consul at early in the war. Was allowed to leave as a as a diplomat with his family. He knew General MacArthur. When General MacArthur knew that he was out of Manila, called him back to Australia, and then he used uh, Chick Parsons as really the eyes of uh, and 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 hand of the American military, going back into the Philippines, bringing in supplies by submarine, and organizing the guerrilla operation. So Claire Phillips knew who John. John Boone was. John Boone knew who Chick Parsons was, and in turn, Chick Parsons was really the, the intermediary with General MacArthur. Yeah, yeah. Chick Parsons ended up being what I would say is like one of the great spies of World War II. Great, uh, great characters, and these things, these people really existed. But the, you read about it, you say this would make a great movie, and I, I guess you're you're talking about making a movie about this, right? Or, or I hope you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there's there's talk about that. There, there, it's, the characters are really lively enough to 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 be that, and 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 the importance today, you know, also is just just looking at the idea that Americans and others just risk their lives every day, and they were they were not they were common people that that that, that took up the, the cause because they did what they felt they had to do. Lots of atmosphere, uh, really interesting people, and. Um, and a story that I was amazed by, even more so because I knew that my father was patrolling the waters all around there, and he never spoke about it. So it's a story that I think really deserves to be told. Yeah, and yeah, my dad didn't talk a lot about it, like he's most World War II veterans, uh, about their experiences, but uh, he, did, he did say the Philippines was not the place he'd ever want to go to again. So uh, <laughs> he was glad to get out of there after the war. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Now, these and three, as a matter of fact, uh, while I was... Go ahead. Uh, while I was there, um, this would be a good barroom bet. Where's the, where's the largest U.S. Uh, military cemetery in the world? In the world outside the United States, one would say Normandy. It ends up being Manila. Is that right? I think something like twenty thousand uh, U.S. military dead at the at the Manila Philippines Cemetery. It was. It was uh, chilling to just think about how many people uh, fought and died there. Um, so your father and mine uh, made it through, and we're lucky as a result, but, but lots of heroism and lots of suffering in the course of doing that. Yeah, and again, World War II it wasn't a foregone conclusion that uh, America would win, so we needed people like this to, uh, to do these things, risk their lives to, to actually help win the war. Also, the, the Philippines uh, ended up being much harder for the Japanese to deal with. The Japanese thought they would just sweep through and that would be the end of it. Right. But the resistance and the rebels and the guerrillas 
kept the, kept their fight up throughout the war and stopped the Japanese from moving further in their conquests. They were thinking originally of of invading Australia, but they were kind of hemmed in by having to deal with the rebels in in the Philippines, which was another reason why this story is so important. Yeah. The name of the book again is called MacArthur's Spies: The Soldier, the Singer, and the Spy Master Who Defied the Japanese in World War II. And uh, Peter Eisner has been our guest. And uh, Peter, I uh, wish we had a little more time to talk about it, but uh, give out the uh, website if you have it. People can get more information about the book. Uh, you can certainly get it on get the book on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or at, at your local bookstore. But you can also uh, look at my uh, website. The easiest thing to do: PeterEisner.com. E I S N E R. Um, and more about the book there, and also how to buy it. Great, and uh, Peter, God bless our, our fathers, right? For, for they, maybe they, they didn't have a choice back then. They kind of, I guess, you're a volunteer to draft it, but they did great work. <laughs> the greatest generation, indeed, no doubt about it. Peter, thanks for joining us. Hopefully, we can talk again. My pleasure. Thanks a lot. I'm Stan Brock. Thirty years ago, I formed Remote Area Medical to help people overseas, but then we found generations of families in America isolated by poverty from the health care they need. Together, we can take dental, vision, and medical help to a million adults and their kids, right here at home in the United States of America. If you'd like to order the book we're talking about, please go to DougMilesMedia.com and enter the author's name in the Amazon search box. Thank you for listening. Please come back soon for more conversations here at DougMilesMedia.com. This has been a presentation of Doug Miles Media, all rights reserved. You can listen to or download previous programs at iTunes, Stitcher.com, or Doug Miles.